Hello, it's Karen Not here from Primetime Business and I'm here today with Amanda Cullen from coachingwithamanda.com and Amanda has kindly agreed to talk with me today as part of the Primetime Women in Action interview series uh, where I invite um, women to share their journey into setting up uh, a later life business uh, and the hope is that that will provide inspiration, information and a little bit of motivation to those of you um, who are either starting on the same path who are thinking of starting on that same path there's nothing quite like um hearing from people who've been there and done it so welcome amanda thank you so much for joining us thank you it's a pleasure to be here excellent excellent so amanda let's just sort of start by setting the scene um and just tell people who are watching or listening um a little bit about who you are and what you do okay so i am a coach and I combine personal coaching where I work with the over 40s, um, loose definition, but people with plenty of life experience, as I describe it, um, people who want to change direction. So people who are either um, fed up with their current career and wanting to change career, people whose children have grown up and they're becoming empty nesters and they want to do something different, maybe go back to work, or indeed people coming up to retirement and thinking, oh, that's a bit scary, I've got all that time ahead of me, what am I going to do? So those are my personal clients. And then I also do some executive coaching, which is in a very specific niche in the financial services sector, which I come from. Okay, so you know, the thing that really uh, fascinates me is sort of the journey people take. Mm -hmm to get them to where they are and to get them into, you know, starting this business. Sure. So, you know, what, what was your journey? How did you get to this point? Okay, so I worked in financial services as a pension consultant for 30 years, and I was 30 years with the same organization. And um, I loved it. For the first 20 years, I absolutely loved it. Um, I felt really lucky to be in a job that I enjoyed, that challenged, motivated me, kind of played to all my values. And... Um, the problem was that after 20 years, I achieved the goal I'd set myself. Um, and then I didn't really have anywhere to go. And I didn't want to go any higher up the ladder. I was relatively senior by then. Um, and so I gradually became more and more demotivated. So I think it's probably fair to say that I've spent the last 10 years, to a greater or lesser extent, searching for, for what's next, for what did I want to do instead. Yeah, I think that's probably something which is echoed in lots of people's journeys. It, you yeah. know, I used to call that sort of like, I, I I was the same, but I was always trying to scratch that sort of, that itch, which I just couldn't quite reach somehow. <laughs> do, do you know, it's, it's that sort yeah. of thing, isn't it? And, and, and you spend an awful lot of that time thinking, don't be silly, you know, this is fine, you know, why, why nothing's changed, why shouldn't it be just as good as it always was? And, you know, secure job, well-paid job, nice people, don't be so greedy sort of thing. So there was a lot of that in there too, I think. Um, but, but nonetheless, um, the business that I worked for was changing. I think every business has, every organization's changed in the last 10 years and continues to change. Um, and the direction it was moving in really wasn't a direction I was particularly comfortable with. So I think the, um, the impetus to, to do something kind of became greater and greater. Um, and I tried lots of things. So I actually did try career coaching. Um, the kind I had proved not to be for me. It didn't really help at all. Um, I talked to lots of friends. I did lots of moaning like many of us do. <laughs> um, and it was really only about two years ago that I, I effectively had a light bulb moment at um, um, a leadership event that I was volunteering at, I was helping to run, where I just thought, this is ridiculous. This is what I want to do. I want to be a coach. And it literally was grab a piece of paper and scribble down, you know, where do I want to be in three years' time? And it was, I want to be qualified as a coach. I want to be working at most part time. I want to be partnering with other coaches. De -dum, de -dum, de -dum. Um, and I'm quite action oriented. So once I knew what I wanted to do, I didn't have any trouble then kind of getting on and doing it. So I then spent the next 18 months, really, I suppose, uh, training. Um, I'd done quite a lot of informal coaching in my, in my job, um, and I'd always enjoyed the people development side of the work the most, really. So it was kind of a natural progression to go from informal coaching and mentoring to, to learning how to do it properly. Um, and, and I came from a very regulated organization, a very regulated background where it would be unthinkable to do something without kind of professional credentials and qualifications. And I, 
I therefore took the same view with coaching, that I couldn't just set myself up as a coach overnight and decide that I was now a coach when I hadn't been one the day before. So I did look around, look at lots of different organisations, decide who to train with and then, you know, go all guns blazing into, into, into training. So once you made that decision, Amanda, yeah. how did the people around you react? You know, did you, was it, a, did you have positive well, responses from your friends and family? Um, I'm not I'm sure, sure I told, I told everybody straight, straight away because I was still working. working. I'd been okay. working four right. days a week and I carried on working mm -hmm. four days a week. So I fitted the training around it. So okay. initially it was some personal development I was doing on the side, if you know what I mean. I knew that I wanted it to be my next career. And I talked to my family about that, but it was sometime, it was kind of out there, you know, it wasn't immediate. It was sometime in the future. But that was always the expectation. So I think to the extent that, that, that I talked to, to family and friends around me, um, and as, as the training progressed and I needed 10 clients, I did reach out to more people and I did talk to colleagues. Um, and again, they were always very supportive and actually very complimentary, saying, oh, yeah, I can see that's something, you know, that would suit you. Um, so, yeah, so I, I think I didn't really get any negative reaction to it. It's very lucky. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because I think when you do, you know, you're quite vulnerable, aren't you, at that stage? So any negative sort of responses tends to sort of you know, can potentially really sort of knock you off course, can't it? Yes, and I think one of the things that I benefited from was the fact that my training was face-to-face. -face. So I, I trained in a group with two dozen other people. So I had two dozen other people going through the same journey. And although we didn't all aspire to be full-time coaches at the end of it, we, we were doing it for a variety of reasons, we were a very supportive group and we stayed really supportive and we're still in touch. Um, so, so I think you had a support network. Absolutely, and I'd say that's absolutely critical. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, a, and a support network that doesn't have an agenda for you. So not just your family and your friends who care about the outcome and who are affected by the outcome, but people who are unattached. Yes, absolutely. Um, I just want to talk to you um, about age. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, setting up a business is challenging for everybody isn't it you yeah know, it's, let's just face it it's yeah. a challenging thing to set yourself mm -hmm. to do but I think for older women there's a perception that oh for many of them they, they sort of they also have this additional sort of worry about you know God, have I left it too late am I too old to do this um did you have any of those thoughts and if so how did you uh, deal with them um to be honest, no, far from it. I think the opposite, actually. I would never have had the confidence to do this when I was younger. Right, right. Uh, I always said, and my husband was self-employed um, much of his working life, and, and I'd always said, oh, I don't know how you can be self-employed. I can't imagine doing that. I hate that. <laughs> you know, I like I liked the security, the security of, um, you know, uh, of the infrastructure of a big organization with its HR department and its finance team and its admin support and its IT support um, and the, the camaraderie of a big crowd of people around me. And I, and I just thought there was no way <laughs> that I'd want to go off and work on my own. So actually, it was a huge mental shift. That was the huge mental shift. Um, but the age never really came into it. I think I think perhaps being married to somebody who's older means that, for, and who's still working, means that for me it's like, you know, there's years and years ahead of me yes. of working life. Yes. Yeah, well, it's funny, isn't it? Because I think, you know, people tend to fall into two camps. There are the ones who sort of think, oh, yes, I think I'm too old. And there are people like you, and I think mm. possibly me as well, who <laughs> sort of say, actually, I couldn't have done this before. <laughs> no, I, I, I couldn't. And for me, um, financial security was important. Um, and I don't think I could have done it without, without two things, really. One, the fact that um, school fees had come to an end. And two, that we had savings to fall back on and ultimately pension to fall back on. Right, right. What about, I mean, what would you say has been the biggest challenge that you faced? Um, and how have you sort of dealt with that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, well, at one level, I think the biggest challenge is getting a steady flow of clients. Um, in reality, that's the biggest. That's the biggest challenge. Um, if you're self-employed, is you know keeping the keeping the ongoing work ongoing work coming in. Um, that aside, um, the biggest challenge was actually making the break. 
you know yeah. this 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 move from employment to self employment is like this massive hurdle that i was you know, i don't know why the the, the uh, picture of a um a horse race steeple jump comes to mind this great big fence in front of you that you've got to jump and and it was like unjumpable and then once i jumped it was like what was all that about what's the big fuss about so actually the decision to go for self employed was probably the biggest challenge yeah and isn't it funny how, you know, once you make that decision, it's like, you know, someone almost sort of like firing the starting gun. It's like yeah. it's suddenly you sort of, you do make a shift, don't you? Mentally yeah. make a shift. You are the other side yeah. of that hurdle. And then you look back and as you say, you sort of think, well, you know, what was all that about? But until you do it, it just seems something so enormous, doesn't it? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. And, and the other thing I worried about was isolation or loneliness, because I'm quite outgoing mm. and I like to have people around me. And I do most of my coaching on the phone, by Skype, or, or, or phone or by Skype. So um, so I was a bit worried about not seeing people or talking to people. And nothing could be further from the truth. I've got more like-minded contacts, friends, colleagues now than I ever had before, because actually, I was existing in an organisation where I no longer had any people that I had anything in common with. Um, and and now I've found this whole world of kind of like-minded, self-employed people. And it's such a different world because it's so much more supportive. Yeah, yeah. Now, we talked briefly, we touched briefly about money. And you, you were saying mm -hmm. you could do it because, you know, school fees had finished, etc. And you had a, a pension, etc. And I yeah. think for many women, you know, the money issue is the thing which causes them to sort of hesitate because they sort of think, you know, OK, I'd love to do this. You know, I'm really good at it, etc. But, you know, can I really make enough money? And whilst, mm. you know, I find money is never the main motivator for women setting up mm -hmm. businesses later in life. But, you know, we all have to live and, yeah. you know, so money does play a role. So. How's that sort of, what sort of role has money played in your particular journey, Amanda? Well, it certainly, <clears throat> it was certainly a huge piece of the fence that I had to yeah. jump over psychologically. Mm. The worry about will, will you know, mm. will I make money? Will I make enough money? Mm. Um, the reality is that it takes time to build up a self-employed bit of business. So one of the things that I thought was really important at the beginning was getting getting my head in the right place in terms of um, don't panic if it doesn't come overnight. Um, and in my mind, I gave myself two years and I'm not at the end of that two years yet. So in, in my mind, I've said, you know, I shouldn't be fussing about not making as much money as I'd like to make as long as I'm moving in the right direction or I'm doing all the right positive things. Um, but at the end of two years, I'll need to take stock and say, do I need to change anything? Is there anything else I need to do? You know, is it enough yeah. now? Yeah. Um, so, so that safety net I talked about in terms of safety, of, of, of savings and, and ultimately pension, I suppose I'm lucky covers that two years, um, which is not to say that I'm not making money, but I'm not making as much. I'm certainly not making as much as I was in my corporate job because it was a very well paid job. Um, uh, and I'm not making as much as I'd like to make, um, but I will. I'm yeah. very confident that, that things are moving in the right direction. Yeah. Give us a little snapshot, if you will, of I don't, either a working day or a working week, which will perhaps give people some idea of the different ways in which you do generate um, revenue for your business. Okay, so um, week's probably easier because... Yeah. You know, there's more variety in a week. Yeah, yeah. And I guess in the, in, the, in the course of the week, my time would be divided between um, time, at my, time spent at my computer, uh, time spent coaching, and time spent out networking and meeting people. Um, so the computer time would be a combination of doing emails, responding to emails, um, writing, writing articles, both for my own blog, for my website, and also for guest posts on other people's websites. Um, which is part of my marketing, so I'm not paid for that, but it's part of getting my name out there, getting known for what I do. And being um, interviewed. And being interviewed, <laughs> absolutely. Um, and which maybe takes me to the third one, and let's jump coaching for a moment, which is about the networking. So you and I met through a networking event. Um, and exactly that. So my networking event, my, my networking serves two purposes. Um, I belong to a local women's business network, which gives me both 
um, potentially potential referrals and leads, but also that, that support that I was talking about, because we're all in the same boat um, and we're all very supportive of each other. So um, hints and tips on things to do, as well as um, kind of moral support when the going gets tough. Yeah. Yeah. And the middle piece, which is really at the moment the only uh, significant revenue generating piece, is the actual coaching. And that divides into, at the moment, that divides into two parts. The, the personal coaching, which is probably um, 80% of my time, okay. and the executive coaching, which is more like 10 to 20% of my time. But in revenue terms, they're about 50-50 because executive coaching is corporate rates and therefore more lucr lucrative. Um, and, and was the route that I thought I'd originally go down and then decided to, to take a break from that focus on the financial world, the financial services world. Um, and I'm loving the balance now. And, and the balance may shift between 50-50, 80-20, I don't know. Um, but at the moment, having both streams, both strands is, is, is really great. Yeah, I mean, and I think, you know, businesses just evolve all the time, don't they? You know, it's just you have to do something to find out whether it is actually going to be the path you want to take. And then you can take stock and say, well, actually, you know, I want to do want to take it more this way, want to go more into the executive coaching or the personal coaching or as you're doing. There's no reason why you can't have different streams Elements. anyway. Okay. Yeah, exactly right. And then in addition to the, so, so most of my coaching, as I said at the beginning, is done over the phone, but I recognize that I'd like to do more face-to-face -face coaching. So at the moment, my focus is building my, my kind of, uh, my presence locally so that I can get, get more local clients. And one of the things I'm doing is launching a group program in the autumn. Um, because I love working with groups. I did a lot of that in my job, um, facilitating group discussions and tra running training sessions. So, um, so building group programs will be the, will be the next um, new area of focus. Can you try and describe what your business gives you personally? Yeah, um, well, it gives me a buzz. That's the simplest word. Um, it, there's something, it, and, and it does feel a bit corny, or at least it feels to me that it sounds corny when you say I like to make a difference, because it's slightly overused these days. But, but there is something very exhilarating when a client shifts. Yeah. So um, there are times when I think, oh, God, I really don't want to coach this afternoon. I really hope they cancel. <laughs> I'm really not in the mood. And very occasionally they do cancel, and of course afterwards I'm cross. But um, usually they don't. And 99 times out of 100, I come off the phone or I come off the Skype, Skype call buzzing. Yeah. Um, and I'm, I'm almost on a high and it's because I've made a difference to them. Um, or they've made a difference to themselves with my help. Yeah. It's probably yeah. a better way of putting yeah. it. So um, that's what I get out of it. Yeah. And what about you personally? Mm -hmm. You know, Have you recognised that you have actually changed as a result oh, of you know, starting this wonderful new business all by yourself. Yes, definitely. I mean, uh, in some ways you'd have to ask other people of what difference they see. Um, but to me, I'm much more relaxed. I've got fewer aches and pains, actually. I used to suffer, still suffer from some back pain, but used to suffer much more. And that's partly because I'm less stressed and it's partly because I'm spending less time sat at my desk all day long. Um, and I love the flexibility. You know, so that's great. If it's a gorgeous day, I can go and do some gardening or sit in the garden and read a book and then maybe I'll work in the evening. Other days I might be doing 12 hours of work or even 14, perhaps if I particularly if I'm helping at a, uh, running an event or something like that. Um, you know, I can be full on for, for, for much more. So there's much more, um, yeah, much more flexibility in the week, which is which is fabulous. Um, and. It's great that I have um, more time for my daughter, who's at an age where she needs my support too. So um, I, I'm able to um, to give her time in the day um, if if she needs it. So not not obviously to eat into a previously committed coaching time, but building around that. Yeah, like you said, it is about the flexibility to use your time the mm. way you want to use it and when you want to use it. I, yeah. I know that, you know, sometimes I, I take the train into town in, in London and I'm there on the train and there are all these people jammed together. And I think, oh my God, I could not do that now. You know, mm. just because I know there's a different world out there. I mean, well, some people don't yeah. have a choice, but it's just like, no, I could not do that anymore. 
I agree with that and I still love the buzz every now and then of getting on the commuter train and going in. Um, there is something about, because it's London that I live here, um, there is still that buzz and that energy of people going to work in London that you do miss a little bit sometimes. So, so for me actually, a re- and I, I probably go into London once every three weeks maybe for a meeting or for an event or something like that. And I enjoy that, but I agree with you. I'm not sure I'd want to do it five days a week. No. no. (laughs) Um, Okay, Amanda, so we're coming to the end now. So perhaps you could leave us with, you know, now that you have the benefit of hindsight, some top tips that you would like to pass on to anyone else who's thinking of taking the same path. Um, I think the two would be, uh, yes, it's scary, but just go for it. If, you, if it's what you want to do, we always say nobody ever regrets not spending more time at the office. Yeah, um, and there is something about, there's something about nothing's forever. So if you do leave your job and you go and do something else, it doesn't necessarily have to be what you're going to do for the rest of your life. It doesn't count. Um, but if you'll never know unless you try it. Um, and then the other one, having said that, the other one would be something about staying power or stamina and not expecting great things overnight, but being patient and recognizing that it does take time. It will take time to build a business. So set your your time scale. I set mine at two years, but set your time scale for giving it a really good go before you um, decide whether or not it's worked. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's fantastic. I think, you know, you saying that reminds me of that wonderful Susan Jeffers quote, you know, feel, yeah, the, feel fear the fear and do it, do it anyway. anyway. You just... And that's the bottom line, isn't it? Yes, you know, it is scary, but the fact that it's scary also sort of tells you that it's quite important to you, you know? So you just got to embrace that fear if you can. Easier said than done, I know, but embrace the fear. And as (laughs) you said, you know, what? try it. Just give it a try because you don't regret the things that you try, just the things you don't. I think so. Well, thank you so much, Amanda. It's been really great talking to you and uh, I wish you every success with your business and um, if anybody wants to contact Amanda or find out more about her all her details will be below on this same page so on that note I'll say bye-bye and uh, thank you once again bye bye